Debbie Applegate, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I am thrilled. So uh, your book is such a fun piece of literature. I feel, I feel like I'm watching a movie and at the same time I'm getting drunk on some illegal whiskey and having a huge bag of food that I'm not allowed to eat because I'm going to get fat. So it's like a whole <laughs> bunch of things that I'm not supposed to be doing, but I'm having so much fun doing that. I wonder <laughs> if we could go and you tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, I mean, what is it that got you inspired into writing this biography? And this is not your first biography. You wrote another one 13 years ago, as, as my notes tell me. Uh, yeah, tell us about your background. What inspired you to become a biographer? I am I am probably more of a, than a more than a biographer. I am probably a historian. I, I like old stuff, uh, and so whenever I uh, in the, when I was a kid, I like to read and I like to be around old stuff. And so that is a that's a sucker's uh, position because that's how you end up living your life in a library, uh, which is what I ended up doing as I went to school and got a PhD as a historian. Uh, but then when it came time to be a professor, that's a lot of hard work. And that wasn't the part that I really liked. What I like is the research, the part where I am sitting uh, among all the dead people with all the books and the old papers and peeking through other people's closets uh, and calling it a job. Uh, and so when I got my PhD, I thought, well, maybe, maybe I could write books that other people besides scholars would read. Um, but the problem is deep down, I'm a scholar. So it, I had to learn how to, uh, to make that bridge to writing for a popular audience and also uh, doing the deep research, which is the part that I like. Uh, so my first book was the biography of a uh, once very world famous minister who had the one of the very first mega churches in the United States, uh, a guy named Henry Ward Beecher, who is probably best remembered now as the uh, little brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, but and he too had uh, some some sin, even though he wanted to be a saint, uh, in the end, he was almost brought down by a big sex scandal. Uh, but when I was done with that book, I thought this is ridiculous. That took forever to write. Uh, who the hell knows if anyone's gonna read it? Um, and I'm never gonna do this again, because this is, this is a silly way to make a living. Uh, it's not really a living, let's say that. Uh, if you get paid by, if you actually break down the amount, a dollar per hour, uh, it's pennies, pennies. Um, but, uh, but the book went well, that first book, it, it won a Pulitzer Prize, it was actually read by people. And I think I was flattered into thinking I could do it again. And um, I don't have children, but I have the feeling that it's a little like having a baby. Uh, you forget how hard it was to have that baby uh, once you've got a kid. And so uh, I thought this time, again, foolishly, I thought I'm gonna move out of the 19th century, away from the ministers, I'll go to madams, I'll go from the saints to the would-be, to the unrepentant sinners. Uh, I didn't mean to do it that way, but I did think I would move into the jazz age of the 20th century, the 1920s and the 1930s, which uh, certainly here in the United States and in many countries uh, is considered a kind of glamorous time uh, filled with gangsters and the sexual revolution and flappers and uh, music and uh, entertainment. Uh, and I was thought, well, I'll just look, I'll see. And I was looking through some books uh, in the Yale Library, the university library here. And I ran across um, a little red volume, a little slim volume that was, I had never seen it before. I'd never heard of the author before, but it was the memoir of this woman named Polly Adler, who had lived in the first half of the 20th century and had be, been one of the most famous madams in American history at a central point uh, in New York City's history in the Jazz Age. Uh, and her house served as a sort of uh, underworld salon, uh, if you will, for uh, big thinkers, for entertainers, for gangsters, for politicians. And I thought it was a great little book. 
It was so much fun to read, but it was clear that she had left a lot out, as you can imagine. And so I thought, ah, this will do. I, I can start down this road. And I'm not even sure I quite meant to. It just happened that way. The way one gets on the primrose path, to use Shakespeare's phrase, and then before you know it, you are all the way down the path and it's too late to come back. Uh, so that's how it started. Uh, but it took, as you say, 13 years to get wow. to finally get done with that journey. And let me ask you, how does an academic learn to write for a popular audience? How do you shift that? How do you flip that switch in your head and say, okay, I'm not going to write this for my fellow academic historians. I'm going to write this for everybody else. Well, to be honest, uh, I didn't do that very well at first. I, uh, in fact, I did it so poorly uh, that I lost my book contract for the first book. I sold, uh, I sold, uh, I sold the um, the proposal, and then uh, all of a sudden, when they saw the first couple chapters, they were like you don't know what the hell you're doing. And it was clear, no, I did not know what the hell I was doing. Uh, and so I probably would have quit in discouragement at that point, uh, but I, they had paid me some money and I had to pay the money back. Uh, so I had to resell the book and keep going. Uh, so what I did at that point was I uh, went, I figured, what is it? What are people doing when they're reading? And what am I doing when I'm writing? What is the ultimate, when you break it down to the final question, what am I doing? What is that I want the reader to do? What I wanted the reader to do was turn the page was read the next paragraph, read the next uh, sentence. And so I thought, well, if, it's, if that's it, if that's the only goal, get the, get the reader to stay interested enough to read the next sentence, then what's, what's behind that? And that's when I realized, well, uh, suspense. Uh, the, 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 I wonder, I wonder what's going to happen next. I wonder what are they going to do next? Uh, and so I went and checked a bunch of books out from the library. This is a while ago. This is now 15, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, probably. And I checked out a bunch of books from the library about how to write thrillers and how to write mysteries, which I knew nothing about. And there were exercises there. This is how you, this is how you begin. This is how, the, these are some of the rules. And I just started copying. I started doing the exercises and I started trying to learn it from that direction. And that made a difference. Even now, um, I'm much better at it, uh, but I still sometimes use some of those exercises uh, that I learned in those books. My favorite book was one called Action, Conflict, Suspense. Uh, <laughs> I, still, I still use that one all the time. And let me ask you, what is it about the 20s that make it such a culminated time in U.S. history? I have worked as a part-time photographer, and I have gone to many parties that are supposed to be the Grand Gatsby team on, on weddings as well. And, you know, there is this opulence and excess and everything else. I mean, but all those things uh, are in part of the U.S. history after that. Why in particular the 20s seems to have the, the, the label as the era of excesses? Well, I think there's um, two main things. Um, one thing is after World War I, uh, you know, much of Europe had been destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the United States becomes this economic powerhouse. We are now uh, the leading economic actor in all of the world. And, and we are really coming of age uh, as a nation, and uh, New York City is coming of age as New York, as the United States' most important city, the city where um, people are converging to do business, to uh, create things, to have freedom that you couldn't have in your small town or in another country. Uh, so it's flooding with immigrants and from people with from across the country, all coming here because they want to be part of something exciting and new. So that's part of it is we're in this economic flowering. So there is money to go around. And as we all know, when there's money washing around, everything is a little more uh, deluxe, a little more glamorous, uh, a little more active. Um, but the other thing that was, I think, crucial is um, the introduction in 1920 of prohibition. Uh, that's what we call in the United States. What it was was an amendment to the Constitution outlawing the manufacture, transportation, and sale of alcoholic liquor. So that is 
a very big deal since liquor is probably one of the oldest human inventions uh, to try that when and, and one of our favorite vices as humans, uh, the idea that what was going to happen was that uh, the American government was somehow going to make having a glass of beer or a glass of wine illegal. Um, kind of turn things upside down in a way so that um, things that uh, before no respectable person would have done, uh, no respectable woman would have gone into a saloon to have a drink uh, or, or gone dancing in some kind of sort of uh, sleazy uh, dance hall. Now, all of a sudden, if you just wanted to have a glass of beer, you uh, needed to consort with criminals. And it sort of gives... Uh, the criminal world, uh, the underworld, the world of vice, uh, a kind of chicness that it didn't have before, a cachet. All of a sudden, people are very curious. They're, they now everyone knows a criminal. If you wanted to buy, uh, you know, some uh, some rum, uh, and at the same time, you're having a real sexual revolution. Women are entering the workplace. Women, young women, are coming to New York to seek their fortunes or to have adventures. Uh, and so you get all this confluence of money, illegal money, and cultural ferment. Uh, it's, and for a little while, it all comes together, especially in New York City. It's true everywhere, but especially in New York City, uh, for a little while, it really is the center of the world in a, for just a moment. Uh, they will still probably say that they think they're the center of the world, but uh, for this moment, it really was. Uh, and, and much as it was really dark and gruesome and there was a lot of violence and there was a lot of abuse, it also did have a genuine real glamor to it. Well, I'm in Canada and our history books don't mention this, but the, the prohibition increased immensely the national product of Canada because oh, yeah. I guess all those bootleggers used to buy some, uh, some good Canadian whiskey over here and bring it down to New York. Oh, Canada is huge, huge. All these people who never had any reason to go to Canada before are all heading up to Montreal. Montreal was a major place for the bootleggers to come and work their way down. Uh, and in fact, there is something called uh, the bootleg trail that comes down from Montreal uh, down to upstate New York and into Manhattan uh, because yeah, the Canadians, I don't know, you people are obviously much more respectable than we are and yet you kept us well fed and with booze for a long while. And since you mentioned Montreal, this is a side, um, side advertisement for Montreal and it's not a good advertisement neither, but um, uh, I equate what I'm reading in your book with the Montreal Grand Prix, because at that time, sure, all the advertisements mentioned these fancy cars and, and parties, but there is the underground industry of prostitution that at that time of the year is almost like Christmas time. And, and that's when all the pimps and all the prostitutes yep. get ready for, uh, for uh, the big payout. And of course, we don't see that in the tourist guides, but uh, <laughs> people know what's going on. Oh, uh, in the newspapers at the time, they will describe um, up at the Canadian border uh, that they would have big meetups of all the bootleggers. And of course, you would bring women with you because the Canadian border was not necessarily loaded with prostitutes at that time. So they would have, uh, it was quite something. It was a well known thing in the underworld that they would meet up to, you know, meet your buyers and your sellers and, and celebrate. I did not know that that still has a history uh, there. I thought that was a secret history. Frankly. Oh my God. If you if you ever come for a Grand Prix, you will see the under on the current business going on behind the, the hood of those beautiful ferrari cars well uh, you are making you are making it sound attractive <laughs> <laughs> well okay so let's speak about uh, the book madam what does what is a nice jewish girl from russia doing in a bordello well you know uh it, she always said i'm kind of a typical american success story uh but from upside down uh she um she she's born in, in 1900 in what is uh, then uh, Russia, uh, white Russia, actually now is Belarus, uh, at a time when there was a lot of poverty, uh, a lot of anti-Semitism. Uh, and at a certain point around the age of 13, her father decides that he is going to uh, take the whole family to the United States. 
Uh, but of course, he can't really afford to send them all at the same time because they have a large family that costs a lot of money. Uh, so he decides he's going to send his oldest child, who is Polly, uh, first, and she will help earn money, send back the money, uh, and then little by little, they'll come over in installments. Uh, and it probably would have worked just fine. Uh, there were many families who did that. Uh, but the problem is World War I comes six months after she arrives in December of 1913. And that cuts off all travel to and from Europe and to and from Russia. And in effect, Polly is stranded in the United States, living with strangers, very, virtual strangers, uh, and trapped in, it, she can't, she's not getting an education. She has to work all the time to pay, to try to make a pay for her room and board, otherwise she'll starve. Uh, and she is a lonely, she's lonely, she's broke, she's friendless, she's without an education, without skills. Uh, and this is where her life takes a very different turn. She was very from a very respectable family. There, she was not born into a life of crime, but she goes to New York and she quickly realizes that uh, she's making $5 a week, you know, sewing in a, in a garment factory, sewing corsets. Uh, and well, she says the big turning point is uh, she falls in love with her boss at the factory. Uh, and he, instead of falling back in love with her, uh, rapes her. Mm -hmm. When she finds out she's pregnant, he won't marry her. He refuses to marry her. And she, uh, he also refuses to help pay for an abortion, which is illegal, but very common uh, at this time. It's still not uncommon at all. Uh, but she has to find the money to pay for it. So that's, she's very uh, shady on this sort of turning point. But this is where she says things changed. And I, this is about when she decides, look, if I turn some tricks, uh, to use the lingo of, of the sex trade, uh, I can make four or five, six times the amount of money that I can make in a week uh, by working in a respectable job. Uh, men are clearly willing to pay more for my body than for my mind. And that that's those were just the facts. You can make so much more money as a prostitute than you could as a respectable worker that it, it started to look uh, it started to look crazy to her. Why would I not do that? Who cares? Nobody has, nobody has cared so far. Respectable life has not helped me one bit so far. So why not try that? Um, she quickly discovers that uh, she has a good head for math and running a business. So by the time uh, not, she's 20 years old in 1920, just as prohibition is beginning, she opens her first brothel in New York City. It's right across from uh, the very prestigious Columbia University, uh, an all-male school. So I'm sure that was a very convenient place to uh, start. Uh, and she's good at it. She's very, she's very good at running a business. She's good. She's making money like crazy. Uh, and very quickly, she decides to expand. Uh, she becomes uh, very integrated into many of the early bootleggers who are just starting to make uh, massive fortunes with the sale of liquor coming from Canada and coming from England and from Barbados. Uh, and they've got money to burn. They are making so much money. They're paying no taxes. They're, uh, that they start spending a bunch of money in her house. Uh, their imprimatur uh, brings other people who are fascinated by this sort of underworld uh, mixing of what, what she calls, um, she calls her house uh, a speakeasy with a harem. Uh, basically, so you could come in, you could have drinks, you could gamble a little, you could have a nice meal, she always had good food, uh, and if you wanted to, you could take one of the girls to the bedroom, or you could just use it as a kind of clubhouse where nobody is going to pry, and uh, you have a lot of privacy, and so very quickly, by 1924, she is catering to many of the big writers, popular playwrights of, on Broadway, the Algonquin Roundtable, a very famous little clique of, of humorists and write, writers and theater people. Uh, that brings in the big money of uh, the sort of cafe society types. Uh, it brings in all the big businessmen who use women as a way to kind of grease the wheels of commerce. 
Uh, and by the height of, by the time the twenties are really roaring, she is making something like a million dollars a year in our money, easily, easily, perhaps more. Of course, she's also paying out a huge amount in bribes, but for her, the overhead was worth it. So you mentioned at the beginning, uh, just to put things into context, that she went from earning about five dollars a week to uh, about a hundred dollars a week, and that's that's a big jump in in just living standards. Uh, <clears throat> I wonder if she was an ambition, ambitious person full of self-confidence, or if this is something she developed along the way. Because, you know, one thing is to go from uh, $5 to $100 a week, which it seems like a nice right. improvement on your life. But now to have the ambition and the ambition to increase it to a, a million dollars per year of those, more, those dollars time, that's something else. That's something that maybe is not so common a lot of people did prostitution oh, yeah. at that time, but none of them had that grand, grand vision of, of expanding it and making it like a high class social uh, gathering place. I, that's exactly right. So there, there are probably two things going on there that you are putting your finger right on. Um, one thing is for a lot of immigrants in this time, uh, it still happens uh, when people immigrate. Uh, you have people who in their own countries, she had quite a good education for, especially for a girl, you know, what you did get so much education as a girl. She was very ambitious. She really had wanted to go to school and go to college. Uh, later on for a little while, she considered quitting the business, the sex trade and, and starting her own business as a respectable, you know, is a, in the, having her own sh shops. Um, but, but there are a lot of people like that in her milieu. Some of the big gangsters of the day um, who became famous, Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky, um, Bugsy Siegel, they were very similar that they came over as immigrants who, if they had had more of an opportunity, would have made themselves uh, perfectly good fortunes in a normal way, but they were really cut off from opportunity. They didn't speak the language, they didn't have education, they didn't have a lot of supervision a lot of the time, so they didn't get the kind of nurturing that would allow them to have real careers uh, in, the, uh, in the upper world. Um, so the other thing is uh, that because she was not born in chaotic criminal conditions, but was essentially a middle-class girl who was thrown into these, uh, to these conditions. It meant that um, unlike a lot of people in the criminal world, she had a lot of uh, steady habits. She didn't do drugs, hated drugs, really with a passion. Uh, she did not find herself involved in, with pimps, with people, men who were going to exploit her. Um, she had a kind of inner confidence that she, that she brought with her, um, but she also had skills. She could she could do math, for example. She could keep books. She was she had a fabulous uh, set of ledgers that she would keep on both her customers and on the women who worked for her. She could um, save money, which frankly uh, most people in the underworld do not do very well. Uh, she gambled a little, but she didn't gamble a lot. So for somebody who had a lot of, uh, who was living in the queen of vice, as they called her, uh, she herself looked a lot more like a middle-class lady. She did like to take a drink and she did smoke, chain smoke uh, until, she, until she died of it from lung cancer. But otherwise, no, she had the skills and the steady habits and the ambition mm. to pull ahead of her, her competitors in a way that you don't see very often. You are quite right about that. And you mentioned that a lot of people use her services to grease the wheels of commerce, as, uh, as you just mentioned. And now uh, my question is, uh, there is, of course, there is always a stigma against prostitution. If I, let's say, if, uh, let's say, I really don't know whether prostitution is legal or not here in Montreal. It's just that the sex is so freely available. I don't, even, I don't, I, I have an inquiry of whether there is a commerce there or not. But let's say prostitution is legal here in Montreal, okay, for a moment. If I bring a client to a fancy restaurant and I pay a thousand dollars for a meal and some wine, yeah. nothing think twice of it. 
But if yeah. I bring my client to a fancy restaurant, we have meal, wine, and a prostitute, then the whole business deal seems to be, uh, I don't know, uh, shady or immoral or something tainted, mm -hmm. let's say. And I wonder why there is still that stigma being that in so many countries, prostitution is illegal by yeah. now. Well, I, there are really two questions going on there. Because uh, one is, why is prostitution still stigmatized since it is so common, the world's oldest profession, supposedly? Um, and we could set that question aside for a moment because that's a big question uh, th that I've thought a lot about. Um, on the greasing the wheels of business, uh, you know, I, I read a number of businessmen, um, their accounts of why they, why they would use a prostitute. Um, uh, certainly some of the gangsters and politicians also like to use prostitutes as a way to, you know, uh, ease their, uh, if, if you throw in a big party, a big glamorous party with a bunch of easy women, sometimes a bribe doesn't feel so much like a bribe. It feels like a gift between friends. Um, but there was also, so one thing is, um, as one business, one CEO, uh, head president of a company said, listen, uh, when I have a, a client that I'm trying to woo, uh, if, we, uh, if we don't know each other, but we get together and we look at naked women together. We go, so we go to, a, well, nowadays you might go to a strip club. Those are perfectly common. And I know those are legal in most places, certainly in Montreal, uh, that you go to a strip club, say today, and you you did something kind of forbidden. In fact, that's what the uh, psychologists call, call it is the, um, the bonds of forbidden transgression. You're, you're, you're transgressing rules together. You're breaking the rules together and you kind of become bonded bonded together because we got away with something. We did something that we're not supposed to do that was really fun. And, and now we're kind of friends. And like, when you're great friends when you didn't even know each other before. So that's one reason you do it. Another reason is, as one of these businessmen said, is because there is a, a slight element of blackmail to it. You don't necessarily say you're going to blackmail them, but as one of one guy put it, says, if I know that my customer uh, spent uh, spent the night with a prostitute that I provided, that's a little edge mm. that I have over them, especially if they have a family. Uh, and I mean, he says it's not exactly blackmail, but it's a little bit there. And certainly, that is what the gangsters and the politicians were always doing uh, in her house, not just. <laughs> getting away from prying eyes where they could confer and pass bribes and make plans, but also a place where you knew, hey, you can't tattle on me and I can't tattle on you uh, to be like a little kid. I can't. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they, it, women have a very complex role to play in business and it still happens. I spent I would, trust me, if I were hanging around Montreal, I would have asked if it was legal because I, for a while, when I was working on this book, would ask men all the time, do you think there's still a stigma around prostitution, more or less? And most of the time people, why are you asking me that? I said, no, no it's not personal. I, they, I think people do not look on prostitution the same way as they did. I think prostitution was much more common in the older days. It, you would have, um, red light districts, as we call them here in the United States, uh, where the brothels and the saloons and the dance halls would all be kind of clustered in certain neighborhoods. And they were sort of tolerated as long as they didn't spill out into the rest of the city, most or the rest of the town, most people would say, okay, we need to have some vice, let's leave it over there. And for that reason, um, many young men, that's where they lost their virginity. That would, in fact, it was considered no respectable girl. You, nobody would want to marry would have sex with you in the old days before marriage. You, you, you wanted to be with a bad girl. There was a real belief in there were bad women and there were good women. And as one guy I read said, you married the good women and you screwed around with as many of the bad women as you possibly could. Uh, and so the idea that you wouldn't even try to have sex with your real girl with the woman you wanted to marry because that would be to somehow you know defile her you would go be with a prostitute and then you would marry and have a respectable life now i don't think i don't think as many young men lose their virginity from prostitutes i don't think it is as common to go to a house of prostitution but listen the internet has clearly 
made it possible to do all kinds of things uh, mm. that we don't know about. So I am, sh I, I am not under any illusion that prostitution is dying out. No, of course not. Okay, well, uh, so Polly Alder had this amazing, interesting life. I wonder uh, what moment she decides to retire and what was her retirement like? She works in the business for 25 years, which is a long time. It's a tough business under the best of circumstances. Uh, and she did, she was arrested many times. She did go to jail for one short brief period in the 1930s. Um, she made and lost many fortunes uh, because it costs, costs a lot to be arrested all the time uh, and to pay off as many people as need to be paying off. But she also saved a lot of money. Um, and in 1945, uh, world, she works all the way through World War II, which is a very fat cat time, kind of time. There's a lot of war profiteers, a lot of people making money off of the military in New York. Uh, but then she's, you know, she's in her 40s. She, it's a young woman's game and the and prostitution is not what it was. It doesn't, it, it is more stigmatized. Uh, there are more uh, women who are willing to have premarital sex. You don't need the same sort of services uh, that she provided. Um, the other thing is, this is what she told a friend of hers. I was never able to prove this, um, but, uh, she told a young friend when she was near her death um, that she provided women for Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who uh, became president of the United States in 1932. Uh, and it was before he became president. It was probably around the time that he was running for the governor of New York City. Um, but she had to be very, she had to promise to keep her mouth shut. And in exchange for her silence, uh, she was receiving regular payoffs from prominent Democratic politicians uh, for the rest of her life. So she had money, she had a sort of an annuity uh, kind of set up, uh, and she was tired. You know, she was ready, she was ready to get out of the business. Uh, so she moves to California, where everyone Everyone in New York seemed to be moving at that time, tired of the cold winters uh, and she, where she had a lot of friends. And what's interesting out there is, uh, you know, you don't just just because you retire and you move out to the sunlight doesn't mean a lifetime of trauma fades away. Uh, she still wasn't very happy. Uh, of course, she'd had a very hard life. Uh, so she decides uh, and she still wanted, she wanted to reclaim some of that stature that she had and, and maybe even turn it into something more. And she knew plenty of uh, newspaper reporters and, and, uh, and criminals who had written books and who had had their books turned into big movies. So she thought, I'm going to write my memoir. I'm going to write an autobiography. And she worked on it for years. Uh, people every publisher turned it down because they did not want to be tainted with her name and her reputation. But finally, she gets a publisher in 1952. And it comes out in 1953. And it is a blockbuster. That's the little book that I discovered oh. when I first began. It's called A House is Not a Home. Uh, it's, it became a huge bestseller, it sold 2 million copies, uh, was made into a movie. Uh, not a very good movie, actually really a pretty terrible movie. You can still see it on YouTube, uh, but, uh, but it does exactly what it, she wants it to do. It makes her a household name in a no, whole new way. And as, uh, as was noted, by the time she finally passes away from lung cancer uh, in 63, excuse me, 1962, she, uh, all her obituaries read author dies best-selling author dies wow. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well first of all i feel like you just whisper a big secret in the ear of my audience in regards to this political pol pol political connection so thank you so much for sharing that secret and um, secondly uh, i wonder if she was ever accepted uh, by her family i mean her jewish mother uh, I, I don't know if that's the dream that her mother had for her whenever she was sent to america no, 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 no mother dreams uh, that their daughter will become a prostitute or a madam. It's just nobody, as Polly herself 
says, no one is born a madam, uh, no one is born a prostitute, uh, and she would be damned if she was going to die a prostitute. Um, you know, that was always a source of tremendous pain for her. She support, she brought over her whole family from Russia. She supported them almost entirely, her brothers and her parents. Um, and she was obviously very close to her parents and, and adored her mother. And yet, uh, and they did not find out at first. It took a long time. It was only when she got involved in scandals that made the newspapers that she uh, was discovered. But even to the end of her life, uh, her parents would not invite her to for religious holidays to have dinner for like the Passover Seder or uh, any of the high holy days. Uh, they would take her, as she said, they'll take my money uh, but they won't have me for dinner uh, if, it, if God's involved. Uh, and it really broke her heart. And I'll tell you, it also broke my heart because not only on her behalf, but because um, when she died, she had left at least two trunks full of uh, memorabilia, scrapbooks, photograph albums, signed copies of books from all of her big friends who uh, were literary, um, uh, many, uh, even reel to reel tape recordings of her talking about her uh, anecdotes for her book. Uh, and her brother, her last surviving brother, Sam, was so embarrassed by her profession that he threw most of it away. Wow. Uh, and I can tell you as a historian, uh, it still, it still yeah. hurts my heart to think that there was so much more there. But there is, one, um, there is one new development. It is unfortunate that it only happened this week at, long after the book is finished, uh, but I was contacted by somebody who said my family knew uh, Polly's parents very well. And we once visited my parents and I visited Polly when she in the 50s, 1950s. And she gave my parents a copy of an early copy of her manuscript of her book. And it's not just a copy of it, it like the book itself, it is an early copy where all sorts of things have been uh, commented on and marked to be removed because they were too dangerous they were going to get somebody into trouble. There's all kinds of real names and real incidents in there that I don't know about and that I think are going to lead to many more secrets. <laughs> um, so he's going to send me a copy of it this week. And I, 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 I'm very torn because part of me is like, where were you? Where were you two years ago when I <laughs> needed this? But I'm still thrilled. I'm just thrilled that some of that material it still remains. And I'm hoping that more will turn up over time. Uh, although I still curse, I still curse her brother for uh, throwing mm. all that out. You know, uh, Colombian drug dealers, because they feel ashamed of their profession, they give big donations to the church of the yes. towns right. where they come from. And somehow they end up being invited to the religious ceremony. And yeah. uh, there is they are, there is a lot of tribute to Pablo Escobar who donated right. uh, a lot of money to the church and to the whole community. And I guess, I guess he was able to pay for his sins. Well, exactly. And, and uh, Polly, a lot of uh, women uh, in the sex trades have a very soft spot for children for obvious reasons. And uh, Polly donated very generously uh, to orphanages. Uh, in, a, in a similar kind of way. But the problem was, unlike Pablo Escobar and many of the big uh, gangsters um, who were constantly, as you say, uh, trying to buy off their uh, sins, uh, that nobody would ever take her money if they knew her name was attached to it. So she usually gave anonymously because even still, even in the underworld, there is a double standard mm. uh, that we don't mind a gangster. We don't mind a drug dealer or a sociopath, but, uh, but sex, selling sex, that, that, that's a little, still a little hard for us. And that's what, that's the part of the problem with the uh, prostitution. Even if, it, even if it could be made safe and legal, uh, it intersects with some of our deepest, darkest inhibitions and taboos and our deep feelings uh, that I think we will never be able to entirely uh, unstigmatize it, even, even our, at our best. Well, I tell you, uh, David, this book is just 
stupendous. I, I am really having a great time uh, reading it. I wonder if you could tell us one more time the title of the book and where can the listeners follow the work that you're doing? Thank you. Thank you so much that you have you have no idea how touched I am, how thrilled I am. Um, the name of the book is Madam, the biography of Polly Adler, uh, jazz age icon or icon of the jazz age. Uh, and uh, you can find it where on online. There are many podcasts that I've done like this. You can buy the book online and uh, you can listen to it uh, now. They just made an audio recording. And I think the woman who uh, made the recording uh, just won a prize for doing it because uh, it could not have been easy. There's a lot of slang. There's a lot of uh, double entendre, a lot of little dirty jokes in it. Uh, I'm sure it was not an easy job to read that book allowed uh so i tell you one thing i will do next time i am invited to a great gatsby party i'm going to vote to rename it a uh, poly Adler party well you know uh just one last i know you gotta go but one last thing when f scott fitzgerald was writing the great gatsby he based it on a number of Polly's friends who were big bootleggers who were using these parties uh, like Gatsby does as a way to integrate himself into respectable society to you know make his reputation. Uh, but I every time I now I used to love the Great Gatsby, I still love the Great Gatsby. But every time I read it now, I think you didn't able to throw a party like that every weekend. I guarantee you, you needed a party planner. And so Polly is the party planner. For the great great Gatsby types, I guarantee you, uh, they they needed somebody to to round up all of that party. Uh, the, the parties uh, seem like they're fun when you're a guest, but when you're the one behind the scenes, much harder, much harder. Davy, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. It was a delight to be here. <laughs>